Marshall here. Welcome back to Counterbalance. Mike is out of town this week. He is on a whirlwind trip through Central Asia. So I am going to be hosting the podcast by myself today. But the good news is that Mike will have plenty of deeply interesting tales, context, stories to discuss when we come back. So we will do a specific episode about his time in Central Asia. I'm really looking forward to that. It'll be really interesting to just discuss all that because that's obviously a part of the world that a lot of people in this listenership especially do not have as much exposure to. But that's a good pivot to our conversation with our Hudson colleague, Peter Rao, who is a senior fellow. Peter's work focuses on Europe. So that's obviously a part of the world that we are all deeply engaged with and most likely deeply knowledgeable about. So this was a great opportunity just to circle back to the defining arguments that have shaped our discourse around Europe the past five years, Brexit, the state of the European project, the overwhelming nature of Germany, Emmanuel Macron's project in France, how European debates and intervention relate to the Middle East, Asia, and Africa. There's so much to cover here, and this is just such a good deep dive on how you should think about the continent and just helps answer the very basic question that we start with of why does Europe matter and why is it a place that energy should be focused on, especially as we have this broader conversation around the Asia Pacific that's focused a lot of everyone's conversations around these foreign policy topics. And of course, before we get into this great interview, I want to say a huge thank you to Hudson, where Mike, Peter, and I obviously work. It's been really great to do this podcast, and we think that these sort of conversations are exactly the sort of conversations you should be following if you're interested in diving deep into these topics. You can, of course, go to Hudson.org to learn more about Counterbalance and about Hudson's work. There's a bunch of great events that Peter has done around these topics, and you can find them there as well, too. Let's jump in. Peter out. welcome to Counterbalance. Thanks for having me. Let's start with a really meta question. Why does Europe matter? especially in the pro in the especially in the post brexit context well i think there's a broad civilizational link that can't be overstated our country was founded by personalities jefferson madison who wrote our great founding texts that really drew on the enlightenment that drew on european thinkers like locke and uh, in the intervening years until really the transition from british to american international leadership in the aftermath of World War II, it was Europe that was not only the center of events, of course, it was in the Cold War as well, but also the main driver of international affairs. It was the center of power in the world. And so America's always looked uh, to Europe as a kindred spirit, as part of the Western civilization, the Eurasian component of the West. And uh, I think to this very present day, even though Europe has some demographic challenges, it's clearly reducing uh, in power relative to the rest of the world or declining a little bit in power uh, in the global system. It acts as a security blanket for Americans. It's a place we like to vacation, but it's also when it comes to major decisions, uh, an American, uh, the American Republic wants to know that its kindred spirits are on board on difficult decisions. And that's why if you go all the way back to um, such controversial or nettlesome challenges like the war in Iraq, uh, John Kerry in 2004 would hit George W. Bush by saying we didn't have enough European allies on board. Uh, and more recently, during the Trump era, the, uh, the Democrats were, were pretty, pretty aggressive in their criticism that we did not have sufficient European support. So it acts as a security blanket for a liberal democratic peoples like the United States that we have a European support on issues. And it's also why if you speak to American diplomats at the State Department uh, and American officials in the White House, Oftentimes, on our major foreign policy endeavors, be it the Iran issue and the current negotiations, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, all the way now to China policy, uh, really our first point of, of, uh, of collaboration is with the major European capitals. So we run a lot of our foreign policy in the world 
through European capitals. And I think that natural linkage means that Europe still still is important. And then finally, I would just say in, in raw data terms, Europe matters because it's still a huge economy and uh, transatlantic economic uh, exchange remains a foundation of bedrock of American prosperity and power in the world. Since we were discussing before the podcast started, the reason we started that question is just that you were pointing out there's been a, especially recently, a discernible lack of interest in European affairs for many conservatives that is coming from a place of skepticism. But you could also extend that recent critique to the Iraq war time when you're seeing the Robert Kagan dynamic where you're talking about Europe not really mattering as the US was charging ahead with Bush era foreign policy. As the foreign policy debates and questions at hand have shifted, how have you seen just this narrative of Europe's significance or insignificance just change over that 20 year period? Well, I think part of the, the we can almost call it politicization of Europe in American politics um, is parallel to what we've seen with Israel and uh, US politics, just the inverse. So when Republicans are in power, uh, there's a great affinity of late, I think, for for Israel, a growing support uh, for Israel. It's always been rather strong, but I think it's intensified. Uh, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that Donald Trump was the most pro-Israel president in American history. Um, but conversely, I think some of the um, relations, the links, the ties to to some European countries, specifically in Western Europe, have lapsed a little bit. With the Democrats, it would be the inverse. I think now we're seeing some some rocky roads ahead on the Israel-U.S. relationship, the Biden-Netanyahu relationship. But um, uh, the ties with, with Berlin, for example, are on the up and up. And the reason for that is that um, the European project, uh, as it's been built in the post-Cold War era, is one that has eschewed hard power. Um, now, that's not true for the entire continent. We still see, for example, France playing an important role in, in counterterrorism operations in Africa. French soldiers go and die um, fighting um, Islamic militants, for example, in Mali and across the Sahel. But the big regional power in Europe, Germany, uh, has basically given up on hard power. It's It's been scarred by its past experiences. Secondly, there's a demographic problem um, in Europe. Uh, Europe is not reproducing itself. That's, again, in contrast to to Israel, which both embraces hard power, um, it has um, a, a demographic robust uh, growth rate. And then all of that, I think, is related to a conservative critique of Europe as embodied through the European Union being this technocratic project that doesn't have a real esprit de corps. It doesn't have sort of a nationalist under, underlying ethos that really motivates people, that allows people to sacrifice um, for a greater cause. And that's something that's attractive uh, to American um, conservatives. And, and Israel, of course, is, is the exact uh, polar opposite of that. Perhaps um, this is why Brexit has also been so polarizing, because Brexit, in some respects, one could argue, is is economically damaging to, uh, to Great Britain. Um, but not everything is read through the lens of economics. And, and sometimes uh, people are prepared to downgrade their own economic well-being. Now, we'll see how Brexit plays out in the, in the mid to long run. I mean, Britain uh, wants to become global Britain, and it has, it has starting with the Anglosphere, options for economic growth and new links and becoming a global trading power. But, um, but I think part of the reason why Brexit took place is because um, uh, Great Britain wanted a different future for itself, and it was prepared to uh, hurt itself economically to meet its own identity needs. And so um, I think that's a real that's something I think that 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 many on the continent could not understand, at least many in Brussels, um, Germany and, and even France. Yeah, I just want to follow up on the German point, because it's really interesting that we're discussing German hard power or lack thereof as, as a negative, because in many ways we could say one of the great victories of the 20th century was a defanged Germany that is much more content to let itself exist under a U.S. security blanket. So how should we just, as Americans, or just anyone in general in the European continent, think of like the dynamics around Germany's like lack of rearmament? Or decaying, or decaying, decaying hard power is a better way of putting it. I think the starting point for understanding Germany, and part of the reason why there's been frictions with the U.S. under Trump, and while I said relations are on the up and up with Joe Biden, there's still major challenges, I think, between Washington and Berlin, is that no country in the world has had a better three decades than Germany. 
it has been the big winner of the end of the Cold War. Of course, reunification um, was a huge plus for it. But it has ridden the wave of globalization um, and interconnectivity in Europe to become from an economic powerhouse to an absolute economic giant. The, the irony of reunification is that France and others demanded that Germany surrender its currency, the, the Deutsche Mark, and in return, um, uh, it would adopt a, a currency, the euro, which would bind Germany to the rest of Europe. And so it was a way of, of guarding against a reunified strength in Germany in the heart of Europe. But in fact, uh, that wasn't really a price for the Germans to, to pay because they, they gained from this. Now with a common currency, they're able to export um, their goods across Europe and countries like Italy, which haven't grown since adopting the euro, are unable to engage in competitive currency devaluations as a way of strengthening their economy. So Germany is very content and happy in a world of globalization. The problem is, is that uh, the American analysis now is that we are entering a world of geopolitical competition. And so Germany in, in, in the past decades has been, especially under Angela Merkel, who's governed in Germany since 2005, but in attempting to rescue globalization from the clutches of geopolitics. And that, I think, is why we have seen uh, um, uh, Germany and, and the United States have difficulties of, of late, in particular with a view towards China. But it also explains um, why Germany has not, um, has not functionally rearmed, one could say. Uh, Germany was a military power in the early Cold War period. I mean, it had an officer corps that had been battle-hardened and battle-tested, obviously, during World War II. And NATO in the West leaned on that. It was actually quite quite active um, also in the post Cold War period in the wars in the Balkans, where the Germans um, the Germans were active alongside the U.S. in fighting Slobodan Milosevic in Serbia. But of late, it's atrophied. Um, it has huge amounts of wasteful spending. Its procurement processes aren't aren't all that great. And this one could summarize is really the result of living under the American security umbrella. Uh, when there's a lot of domestic pressure, and when I watch German talk shows, uh, you see this applause line all the time, why not spend money on kindergartens instead of, instead of weapon systems? And as long as the Americans are there ready to defend Germany, that's a winning political argument. They don't feel the pressures of, of say, um, of, of Russia knocking on the doorsteps the way countries to their east do. And so Germany, just for that reason, uh, has, not, has not rearmed. And then there's the ideological component of just not wanting to really accept that the world is sliding into competition uh, the way it is. Yeah. How would you assess the success or or inability to succeed when it comes to the Merkel objective of rescuing globalization from geopolitics as a project? Whether or not you agree with it, how successful has that project been? Well, I think it's struggling um, and, it, and it may even be collapsing. You can see there are these you know, forums like the World Economic Forum, which really envision a globalized world in which all the actors get together around a table and deal with nettlesome issues like, like climate change and, and, um, and, and immigration and trade and so forth. But um, they're just increasingly irrelevant or if they're still going through the motions of hosting these sorts of gatherings, they're not actually addressing the problems or developing strategy for the problems that exist today because we are living in a world of, of competition. Because Germany, though, is so important, I mean, it's the regional power in Europe, and economically, you could call it a global power, it's, um, it's, been, it's been able to make some headway in resisting, I think, this turn towards, um, towards um, a, new, a new politics. But uh, I don't think she's, I, I think she's grasping onto this. There are new elections this fall. Uh, Merkel will exit the scene. And it's pretty clear that her successor was going to have to grapple with a fundamentally a fundamentally different world. So, you know, when I look back at my generation, I'm 38, and a lot of my colleagues from grad school and before, uh, when we looked at Europe, we just saw one nice kind of European Union summit every six months with fireworks and everyone was happy and, and expansion was taking place and democracy was, was taking hold in these countries. And ever since, um, if you look at Europe, there has been a growing east-west divide, a growing north-south divide, Brexit hived off uh, the the one of the biggest one of the big three powers in Europe from the European Union. Um, Russia invaded and the next part of a European country in in Ukraine. It's still active um, in Georgia. There's daily threats being made against uh, the Baltic states. 
And um, uh, an immigration wave almost broke the mainstream parties of Europe in, in 2015 when Bashar Assad, together with the Iranians and the Russian Air Force, bombed columns of refugees um, towards the Balkans and, and into Europe. So, um, you know, it's not all been smooth sailing for, 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 for Angela Merkel. And on top of that come, you know, a pair of financial crises. One, the original uh, financial crisis with the collapse of the American housing market, followed by followed by the collapses in Europe, and then subsequently now pandemic induced. So, I, I think she's done her best, but um, the, it, you know it's hard to uh, to to follow an ideological course when events just are moving against you. So this is a useful direction to go. Then, how would you define the post Brexit European project itself, especially? after a year plus of COVID where borders go back up, you really see this inward facing state in a lot of the European countries that is obviously in real opposition to the principles of the European Union and the broader project. How do you just define that project in 2021? Well, Europe is an incomplete project. It has a, a currency union grafted on top of still individual nation states. And so um, I think a lot of European officials recognize that the EU is almost like a tightrope walker moving between two cliffs. And every once in a while, a major gust of wind threatens the entire thing, be it the financial crises, the immigration crisis, Brexit itself. And so at some point, uh, yeah, the EU has to take a decision. Is it prepared to go back to the safe shores of nationalism? where there's kind of a coherent consistency between the powers that are assigned the nation state and the identities of the peoples, or is it going to continue moving forward to a supranational state where you have currency union completed with political and economic union on, on all the other fronts from debt mutualization to assigning all foreign and national um, competencies to, to Brussels. The problem with moving forward, of course, is that um, uh, in the end, Europeans are still nationals. And, and no one would define themselves a European over being, say, an Italian or an Austrian. And we're well, not no one, but very few, despite increases in European identity in the polling. And so that inconsistency, that, that inconsistency between where power is allocated and the identity of the people creates huge weaknesses in the entire, in the entire thing. So that's a problem with moving forward. However, European leaders, I should say, don't want to move backwards because to them, nationalism is uh, equal to, to, the, to the ravages of the 1930s, if not to fascism and, and Nazism altogether. And so, um, so they're, 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 they're in this in-between state. Um, and clearly, a lot of leaders have decided to move forward um, or that they'd like to move forward, led by uh, Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, who's a big advocate of, of moving forward. Um, the problem is, is that, uh, uh, you know, not everyone's on board with this, including uh, the majority of, of Germans. And so um, you have this this uh, this dynamic in Europe where every once in a while Emmanuel Macron gives a major speech, a major address calling for more political and economic union, um, which basically in his mind means French leadership of the EU backed by bankrolled by Germany. And then you have silence from from Berlin because they don't want to offend Paris or, you know, a slow and steady kind of attempt to mediate between all the different European countries because the Germans like consensus. And you end up not being able to arrive at consensus behind Macron's uh, vision. So um, they're still stuck on that tightrope between two cliffs. And, and, and the question is, um, is there going to be a major wind gust that, that blows them off? Additionally, on top of that, I would say that Europe projects this veneer of stability, um, and perhaps France is the best example of this. There are wonderful Bastille Day celebrations where even President Trump was so impressed he wanted to have a similar parade uh, in the U.S. for July 4th, and we, we had something somewhat approximating Bastille Day. But this is with great fanfare where French Mirage jets overfly Paris, streaking the colors of the tricolor into the sky. There is uh, military units marching, bands playing. And so you think, viva la France. France is this great place. Paris is this powerful uh, and great city in Europe. But, you know, beneath, beneath the water's edge, there is Leviathan battles going on between, say, the, 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 the rural countryside, the yellow vests. In, in the outskirts of Paris live, uh, live, uh, uh, live communities that don't recognize really the French state or the secular character of the French state. 
Recently, we had dozens of, of French military officers in a letter warn of revolution or war uh, in France. And so um, you wonder how strong the social structure of Europe is, even if um, these, these kind of symmetry and pageantry of Europe suggest something else. So I'd say on two fronts, one on the European level, you have this, this Cliff Walker who's trying to figure out where to go and is kind of at a standstill. And on the national level, you have, um, you have some weaknesses that, um, that are not being addressed. Yeah, on, on that note, and I'm glad you brought up the yellow vests and the other bits of populist discontent. Earlier, you referred to the mainstream parties in European capitals, the challenges they faced. How would you really assess their ability or how much did they weather those challenges or not? I think the President Trump losing his second term election with Brexit's troubles, either way of like articulating this within the Brexit and American context, how would you articulate this in the um, in the European context? Well, they're trying to learn and to adapt. I mean, just take the yellow vests. Um, that was a a a reaction to, or we, we should maybe say, the spark that really ignited the powder keg was a a planned gas tax increase that President Macron had announced, um, which. It's not all too bothersome if you live in, in cosmopolitan Paris, but if you have to commute to your job in rural France, uh, attacks against um, against your um, your commute is, can be kind of painful. Um, they've reacted to this by, for example, just as in the U.S., we've seen the same thing, announcing a Green New Deal, which means this isn't just greenifying or an environmental policy. It's an attempt to to create jobs, to, to, to frame it in the context of a New Deal uh, policy. So you can see how they're trying to react to react to, react to populism. Um, um, beyond that, I would say that um, there's been a fragmentation of, of the party landscape in Europe. Just take Germany, where we had two parties that over the decades were considered in German Volkspartei or people's parties, meaning they covered the entire spectrum of constituents uh, on the center right and on the center left. So the Social Democrats, and the, and the Christian Democratic Party covered um, all of German society. That was one of their ambitions and to appeal to all, all different segments of society at various levels. They have been um, not reduced to rubble, but they have lost significantly in support. And there's been a rise of, of single issue parties like the Greens um, and the AFD, the Alternative for Germany, which is a, an immigration and Eurosceptical right wing party, all the way to uh, more libertarian um, uh, tax t- uh, t- tax and spend and, and, and liberal um, in the European sense or in the classic sense uh, party. And that means it's it's much more difficult to govern because um, you can no longer govern as a, as a two-party coalition with 65% of the vote, but instead you have to cobble together multiple parties or um, take on board these single issue um, concerns. And that, that I think that becomes, um, that becomes a lot more difficult. A few um, candidates and parties and leaders have shown a lot of promise. Um, in Austria, for example, there is a center-right leader named Sebastian Kurz, who's the chancellor of Austria, who has shown how to defang his, his right-wing populist coalition partner. And as a result, when he was in Washington and he met with President Trump the first time in, in over a, a, well over um, uh, a decade that a, an Austrian chancellor had been invited to the White House, the entire American national security team showed up from Secretary Rick Perry all the way to John Bolton, the national security advisor to the vice president and the president. The Austrians were very embarrassed because he had just shown up with his press spokesman and a member of parliament thinking that it was just going to be a small uh, delegation visit. But it showed they were interested in him because he had managed to navigate the new Europe and be successful in it. And a lot of other parties have not been able to do that. And so um, one hears a lot about right-wing populism because that's what the media is, is inherently focused on. There's a ton of left-wing uh, populism and, and, and modern-day communist parties in Europe, too, that have, that have performed relatively well. So um, long story short, um, there is, a, I'd say, a fracturing of, of, of party, of the party landscape in Europe, a move towards movements, too, instead of parties, which is a big debate um, in Europe. And then, um, you know, different different striations based on where you sit from Italy to Poland to Hungary to, to France. Either merge these questions together or just take them separately. Can you relate Europe to two other big regions of concern for the U.S.? So the Middle East and Asia, especially within the China context. So let's just start with the Middle East real quick. You've had some really good writing and a couple great Hudson events around this. Can you just relate Europe's relationship to the Middle East, especially in the American context as we're debating the U.S. presence there? 
So the Middle East is unlike for the United States, for Europe, an immediate neighbor. And so uh, when there is something like the absolute horrendous and awful collapse of Syria um, due to due to Assad's butchering of his own people's Iran's uh, activities there, Russia's move into the region and the Obama administration's feckless, complete total disregard for um, the Levant and this this absolute central country, Syria, in uh, in 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 the Middle East, an immigration stream will flow into Europe and can destabilize Europe. So clearly, Europe and and the Middle East are connected. I mean, they they are through Turkey quite literally um, separated by 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 the Bosporus, and that's that's basically it. And so um, the Middle East matters a great deal to um, to Europe. Those 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 immigration streams have also impacted um, Europe because it's changing the character of 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 the societies. I mean, so much of American immigration tends to be from Latin America, some for also from Asia, and that's changing. I think the character of our country. Um, in Europe, it's been um, uh, a great deal of Syrian, Afghan, um, uh, and decades past, but wouldn't just consider it a Middle Eastern country, Turkish. Uh, immigration to to Germany in particular and to Europe, which is which has changed the politics and character of of Europe. So you would think that Europe would have a huge interest in the Middle East, and it does. Um, but again, Europe, in large part owing to Germany's um, decision to to abjure hard power, is not in the game in the Middle East because what matters in the Middle East, I would argue, what matters anywhere, but in particular the Middle East is hard power capabilities, and Europe is just not in that game. What they do. Um, uh, with 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 a great deal of um, a great deal of passion is involve themselves in development work and in um, and in financing economic economic um, opportunities and in basically also bailout packages. Whenever there's a war in Gaza, it seems like um, uh, in short time thereafter, the Europeans are called upon to fund um, to fund the rebuilding of Gaza. And you can see in the strategy of say Assad, the courting of Europe for rebuilding Syria. Is is a big plank. So, um, so Europe doesn't have a specific hard power dimension. And there is some European hard power components in the Middle East, but it's very limited. And um, and then because, as I mentioned at the outset, the U.S. values Europe so much and in certain ways, so much of our strategy on, say, the Iran question, runs through European capitals rather than through Riyadh or Jerusalem. At least that's the case in, in, in the Biden administration. And so. Um, they'll take that opportunity to try to shape, you know, uh, the, the Middle East because it gains influence and it, it, it raises the importance of, say, Germany and France uh, and the UK, part of the JCPOA negotiating framework. But really, it's it's not it's a soft power and economic issue, not a hard power matter. So, Peter, you mentioned the JCPOA, something we've discussed a lot on this podcast and at Hudson on a broader level. Obviously, can you bring in the significance of the European specifically in that context? Well, even if the Middle East is governed by hard power, the JCPOA, and this is part of the mismatch, I think, of the JCPOA with regional realities, doesn't address hard power. The JCPOA is basically a German framework, if we think about it. During the Cold War, the Germans uh, believed in what Willy Brandt, the German chancellor, termed Ostpolitik, or Eastern politics. It meant outreach to Russia, build economic links and personal exchanges. And over time, that would moderate the regime or bring about a, a peaceful resolution. That is essentially the thinking behind the JCPOA or one element at the heart of the JCPOA, which is develop through the UN and blessed by the UN, a, a, a framework in which there's exchange, including economic exchange between the West and Iran, empowering the moderates, so to speak. And over time, that would mellow the regime so we could all work together on problems uh, in the region. So um, I, I think the Europeans are at the heart of this because it is uh, it is very much so uh, in, in the European in the European mindset. You have to remember while in the US there's been a vigorous debate about the JCPOA and there are major uh, Democratic members of Congress like Senator Menendez who chairs the, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Schumer, the leader of the Democrats in, in the Senate who opposed the JCPOA, there never was this debate in Europe. It's just considered an unadulterated good because it is so European in its identity. And the last uh, point I'd make is there's a practical reason, which is that um, both the Obama and the Biden administration have routed this through the United Nations. And Europe is still, because the UN is a post-World War II uh, creation, 
disproportionately represented in the Security Council and has disproportionate weight at the UN. So to get it blessed through that framework, um, getting the French and and the uh, and the um, and the Brits uh, on board, along with, of course, uh, the Russians, um, the Ch the Chinese, and the U.S. itself. Those are the five permanent members of the Security Council. Given Germany's economic weight, Germany is added on as 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 a plus one, along with, I would add, uh, UN official EU officials. Can you then take all this European facing context and bring it into the Asia Pacific, especially with China? So China and Asia is very far away for. Europe and Europe is not really a Pacific power. The French have 1.5, maybe 2 million French citizens in their 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 their, their holdings in in the Pacific, um, and so they consider themselves a Pacific power. They still run freedom of navigation operations. The British are sending their new aircraft carrier east of Suez uh, this year. They too are going to run freedom of navigation operations. Even a German frigate is is going to pass through in its circumnavigation of the world, the Pacific, but. In truth, that's an American area of operations, um, together with the Japanese, the Australians, um, to a much lesser extent, the South Koreans, but um, the Philippines, for, for sure. Uh, and so uh, it really is an economic and trading zone um, for Europe. China has outmaneuvered the U.S. and Europe in that in the most important country, Germany, and its most important industry, the car industry, it is capture that industry for all intents and purposes. And uh, when, when, uh, when, when you fly into, say, Bangkok or you fly into a, a Chinese city, you see lots of uh, gleaming lights that say BASF for Siemens or VW. Um, these, are, these, are, um, these are major German companies who have grown very reliant on China. And while there's a little bit of uh, introspection now at the European and at the German level on whether or not this is the correct path, the big companies are still very, very much so addicted uh, to China. And that addiction has only grown post-pandemic because it's the key to German recovery um, from COVID-19. COVID so um, I would say on, on hard power matters, Europe is um, not really a major player in the Pacific, but it's a huge um, economic um, player. And that is a big reason why I think the Biden administration is trying to recruit Europe and especially Germany to a common China policy. In part because there's no point in uh, in the U.S., for example, putting in place an export control if then the back door of Europe is left open, it just means that American companies lose market share as, say, a German company takes over um, that um, that um, uh, that market. So uh, very addicted, but um, there's a bit of introspection and a bit of uh, second thought now in the nature of the of the relationship with China, um, owing to China. I mean, these are these are no kind of Europe particular points of analysis, but everyone knows about massive theft of intellectual property, forced joint ventures, and all the rest that have characterized the Chinese economic model of, of really kleptocratic model now for years. So let's tie everything together. Given everything you've just described about the challenges and open questions facing Europe, why does Europe matter? And should someone who's interested in answering that question in the American context, should they be optimistic or pessimistic given everything you just described? So I, I would answer um, in two ways, one for the economists and for the business community. The EU is the biggest economic zone in the world. It still matters a great deal for um, American prosperity, the amount of exchange that takes place between the US and Europe from foreign direct investment. Uh, the, the Germans, to come back to them, love to tout the plants they've built in, say, Spartanburg, uh, South Carolina, the Mercedes plants in Tennessee, and on and on. So uh, for, for for purely the purposes of, of transatlantic trade links and, and foreign direct investment and economics, Europe is important to American power. And for the, uh, for the, for the security analysts, Europe is the crown jewel in the competition – between uh, the United States and China. It is the western edge of the Eurasian landmass. And uh, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, which I know you've talked about with other guests on this show, stretches across uh, Central Asia uh, and, and eventually ends in, um, in Europe. Um, and in particular, uh, it's supposed to have as its, as its final, final sort of endpoint, the German city of Duisburg. So 
uh, it matters because uh, part of China's strategy is to is to is to become the global leader in key technologies, in key areas, and 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 being able to co-opt, undermine, win over, thieve and steal German technology, European technology, and win Europe over to its side, or at the very least, isolate it um, so that it does not involve itself with respect to anything China cares about. That is a big major goal for Beijing, and so for that reason alone. Um, keeping keeping Europe as as our foothold on the Eurasian landmass matters a lot. Really well said, Peter. Thank you so much. I think this was a really great articulation of where does the European project, how are the players positioning themselves in 2021, and how just the continent relates to the rest of the world. So thank you so much for joining us on Kind of Balance. Great. And it's a, it's a real honor to be on what I'm told is the fastest growing podcast in the world. So thanks, Marshall. Well, Mike's not being here may uh, somewhat affect our growth rate this week, but we are going to push through and make It'll it It'll improve it. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for coming and for the kind words. Thanks. Hope you all enjoyed the episode. Mike will be gone next week as well, but we will also have another great solo interview for all of you. And of course, we all have a really great Central Asia retrospective to look forward to. Huge thanks to Hudson and please go to hudson.org to learn more about the podcast and the work that we do, especially in Europe, the Middle East and Asia. See you next week.